Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this programme today we have a very important interview with the Director of Public Diplomacy at the Israeli Embassy uh, here in London to discuss what's happening in Israel and why it's so important that Christians stand up for Israel and the Jewish people. Warm welcome to the programme. And uh, my guest today is uh, Vivian uh, Olson, who is the Director of Public uh, Diplomacy at the Israeli Embassy in London. Um, your colleagues call you Vivi, so is it OK if I call you Vivi for the programme? Yes. Well, thank you for being here. And it just shows how um, important it is that, as a Christian channel, that we recognise the importance and significance of uh, Israel. And uh, the fact that you're representing the Israeli government it is always a pleasure to have someone of your calibre on the program, Vivi. Um, can I start off with uh, you sharing something about your life and your background growing up in Israel and, and why you wanted to be involved in uh, diplomacy? So, Simon, thank you so much uh, for this invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today. And uh, your first uh, question is uh, a kind of tricky one, because uh, actually I didn't grow up in Israel. <laughs> I was born to a Jewish family in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Oh, wow. And uh, when I was uh, 18, 30, about 30 years ago, I finished my first year at the university. I was studying to be a, a journalist, exactly like you. And uh, I decided to go to Israel for a period of two months, holiday. Uh, I went to work in a kibbutz. You know what a kibbutz is, yes? Absolutely, uh, yes, yeah. And um, yeah, I wanted to, be, to work as a volunteer and to study Hebrew. Uh, I went for two months, and after one month, I sent the, the tickets back to my parents. And uh, I told them that I didn't have any intention uh, to go back uh, to Brazil. By then, I didn't know exactly what I'm going to do next. But I knew that uh, I was enjoying very much uh, the freedom that uh, I had in the kibbutz. Uh, uh, I wanted to stay in the kibbutz. I wanted to study Hebrew. Uh, after a few months, my parents, of course, uh, were totally shocked about my decision. They came to see me. And this is uh, how I found myself in the end uh, of that same year already in the university, uh, studying for a BA in politics and sociology in Jerusalem. Later on, I finished my MA in public administration in the Tel Aviv University. And then I decided to take a gap year to travel around the world. I was in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada. And I saw that what I really love uh, about uh, everything uh, in this world is to get to know new people, to learn about new cultures, to learn, uh, to see new places, to learn uh, new languages. And that's when I decided really to pursue a diplomatic career. I thought that it is going to be, be the best combination between my passion for Israel and my Zionism uh, with uh, the love uh, of uh, learning uh, new things the whole time. Fabulous. Uh, that's, a, that's a great story. Uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting uh, you and your lovely daughter, uh, Yam, up in um, last year in, in Aberdeen. Um, uh, and your daughter is a wonderful spokesman for Israel and also the IDF as well. But how, do, how does her experience of Israel and your experience differ um, o over the generation? So very kind words about uh, my daughter. Thank you very much. Uh, she's going to be here in a few weeks from now, and I hope that we'll be able to interview her for uh, this very same program. Oh, that's fantastic. <clears throat> uh, anyway, I, uh, I think that Israel totally changed uh, over this uh, past 30 years since my arrival. I remember visiting Israel as a child uh, in the beginning of the 80s, and uh, twice with my parents. And it was uh, uh, long before uh, the economic uh, boom, uh, long before uh, Israel became the high-tech nation that we see today. And uh, I remember coming from Sao Paulo, a huge uh, metropolis. Compared to Israel, I found uh, Israel uh, very, very simple, very humble. There were not uh, tall buildings. There were not too many restaurants. Uh, they didn't serve any international food. These are memories of a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 everything was very, very simple. Uh, and I think that today, Israel is totally different than it used to be before. 
Over these 30 years, Israel made a, a huge uh, way into the modern world. Today, you see it became very, very international. You see uh, the architecture. The, the architecture is uh, uh, very changed. We have many tall buildings. The media is very sophisticated. Uh, today, you can find uh, any food you want in Israel. I think that it was open enough to receive influence from all those immigrants that came to live in Israel and uh, many, many tourists uh, that, that, that uh, visit us every year. So my daughter actually grew up in a total different Israel that uh, the Israel that I have in my memories. Wow, that's quite, quite incredible. And uh, you are the Director of Public Diplomacy at the Israeli Embassy in London. Can you share with us what your role uh, entails and your areas of focus and expertise? So public diplomacy, uh, it's also known as uh, soft diplomacy and it differs uh, from uh, the traditional diplomacy. Uh, we focus uh, in the dialogue with uh, the wider community, while the traditional diplomacy focuses in uh, dialogue, bilateral dialogue between the countries in the level of the political leadership. Uh, we have a few diplomats dealing with uh, public diplomacy at the embassy, but under my portfolio, I have the faith communities uh, in this country. Uh, so we try to engage with the Jewish community, with the Christians, with the Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, uh, and uh, the social media is also under my portfolio. So uh, you are all invited uh, to follow us uh, in Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, Israel in UK. And uh, I think that one of the main issues that I, I'm dealing with is uh, the Friends uh, of Israel groups and Advocacy for Israel. Uh, and we have over the last uh, few years seen a real growth in these uh, regional pro-Israel groups right across the country. Um, how important are they uh, for Israel strategically and how important are they to communicate uh, the truth of uh, Israel's situation in the Middle East and, and also to stand with the Jewish people across the UK? I'm so happy that, that you raised this issue because I think that they are extremely important uh, uh, in their support for Israel. Uh, since my arrival here, since about, about uh, six months ago, I visited many churches and many uh, Friends uh, of Israel groups, uh, and uh, we have a huge support in this country. The only thing is that we don't feel the support because the negative bias around is so, so strong and the uh, uh, pro-Palestinian groups and anti-Israeli groups are so vocal that we don't feel, uh, we may think that uh, we are alone in this, in this, uh, in this fight. Uh, so it is indeed uh, very, very important uh, uh, to receive uh, this support. And uh, I would like to encourage each and every one of you, uh, of our viewers, uh, to continue to, to start advocating if they are not advocating uh, uh, yet for Israel. <coughs> and I would suggest a few groups. There are many, many advocacy groups uh, in this country. But as a Christians, as Christians, uh, they will maybe be interested in uh, engaging with a Christian, Christian group. Uh, so one of them uh, is called QFI, is the Christians uh, United for Israel. They, they do an amazing uh, uh, job in uh, advocacy. And to mention two other groups that I think that uh, do a very good work, I would like to mention uh, We Believe in Israel and the uh, IBA, the Israel-Britain Alliance. Everyone is invited to search in the net and engage with these groups. You can uh, subscribe. And uh, they, everyone can, do a, can deal with advocacy. They are able to teach you whatever you need in, in order to start uh, uh, advocating for Israel. And uh, you don't need to be shy. Everyone is able to do that. And it is important indeed. Excellent. So we've got an excellent video to show you, uh, produced by the Israeli Foreign Ministry, entitled, uh, Who are the Israelis? You may have heard a lot about Israelis, but how well do you actually know them? Here are a few facts about the Israeli population that you may not have known. The Israeli population is diverse, encompassing many different ethnicities, religions, and lifestyles. About 74% is Jewish and 21% Arab. Within the Jewish population, 62% are secular and less religious, while 38% consider themselves religious. Within the Arab population, most are Muslim, or 83%, while Christians and Druze are about 9% each. Among Muslims, about 16% are Bedouins. But beyond these major groups, you find Buddhists, Baha'i, atheists, and others from all walks of life. 77% of Israelis are Sabras, the nickname given to people born in Israel. The rest, or 23%, were born abroad in countries that vary from Russia to Ethiopia, Argentina, Morocco, and more. About 9% of Israelis live in rural areas, and the rest live in cities, with Jerusalem and Tel Aviv leading the way as the largest cities in Israel. 
The two main languages of Israel are Hebrew and Arabic, but most Israelis also speak English. You're also very likely to hear Russian, Amharic, French, Spanish, and other languages when you're walking around. Some fun facts, over 5% of Israelis are vegan, the largest percentile in the world. And about 5% of Israelis own dogs. Wait a second, are those the same people? About 8% of the Israeli workforce is employed in the high-tech sector, and women represent over 36% of all high-tech employees in Israel. Last but not least, in the 2018 World Happiness Report, Israelis ranked as the 11th happiest people in the world. There we go. We know who the Israelis are now. Uh, it just shows you, doesn't it, uh, Vivi, the diversity of uh, uh, of Israel, the the religious makeup, the um, the different characteristics of Israel uh, that make Israel the very special place that Israel is today. That's true. That's true. And uh, it's important to point out uh, regarding the Christians, because we are in a Christian uh, TV that uh, the Christians in Israel, uh, the, the Israel is the only country in the Middle East where the Christian population continues to grow every year. And uh, it is a community that is uh, thriving in Israel and uh, all the statistics show that uh, it is indeed a very uh, successful community in Israel. Absolutely. And we, we are very proud of it. Thank you. And we also see many um, Christian Arabs willingly wanting to serve in the IDF as well uh, and to defend Israel from Israel's hostile neighbours and from terrorism as well. That, but that's also a recognition of how important that they see uh, the state of Israel and how they see Israel's also their home as well. Uh, talking about um, NGOs, uh, we have to discuss uh, many of the great works carried out by uh, NGOs, organisations like Mag and David Adom um, and others who, who, if we see a disaster uh, 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 occur in the world, whether it's a hurricane or an earthquake, we see the Israelis are first on the scene uh, and also the fact that, that Israel opens a heart up to uh, injured Syrians caught up in the civil war as well and Israeli soldiers risking their life to bring injured um, Syrians over to, to Israel with the border between Israel and Syria and the Golan Heights with a field hospital to help them. Can you share something about the Jewish character that wants to uh, help people and, and to be the light amongst the Gentiles? Yes, so there is a, there is a, uh, an expression in Hebrew, uh, uh, a value which is called in Hebrew uh, tikkun olam, which means in uh, English uh, fixing the word or we say uh, healing the world. And the idea behind this, uh, this uh, value is that uh, the Jewish people are not responsible only for their uh, only own uh, welfare, but also for the welfare of uh, the entire world. And that's why we always uh, try to add uh, wherever we can. And uh, yes, we also try to empower others so they will be able in the future to solve their own problems. But it is a coincidence that you ask me about uh, uh, the aid that is the IDF gave uh, to the civilian Syrians in the south of Syria, because uh, I, I happened to meet uh, Colonel Eyal Drori, uh, who was here in uh, London, giving talks about uh, about this story. He's retired now, and now he's able to he's free to discuss those issues. And he told me it's very interesting. He told me that everything started in the year uh, 2013 when uh, seven uh, Syrians approached the border. And uh, I believe that they were totally uh, desperate because uh, if you grow up in a country where you see uh, everyday incitement and you learn in school, in your school, that uh, Israel is the devil, you would never be able to come and uh, talk to the Israelis. And on the other hand, you would be afraid because uh, coming to the border could be perceived by the Israeli soldiers as a treat. Absolutely. So I don't know what happened there. But they started a conversation, and uh, the soldiers saw that uh, those Syrians uh, were asking for help and for aid. In the end of the day, they uh, were brought inside Israel to be treated uh, in a hospital inside Israel. And everything was kept very confidential because uh, they could be perceived in Syria as collaborators coming into Israel as collaborators and uh, uh, their lives uh, could be put in danger or the lives of their families. So everything was kept very confidential. But after this first event, many other Syrians started approaching the border to ask for uh, some kind of aid. And it came to a situation in which in 2016, uh, the IDF decided to establish uh, a commando, which was called uh, uh, Operation Good Neighbor. 
and uh, started uh, 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 giving uh, active, uh, actively giving aid to those uh, Syrians uh, in the border. And uh, it looks like uh, about 250,000 people wow. received some kind of uh, help uh, during these uh, two years because it was closed in 2018, in December 2018, when Assad conquered the, the south of, uh, of Syria uh, back again. People receive treatment in hospitals in Israel. They receive treatment in a, a field clinic that was open uh, uh, in the Golan Heights. By the way, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, those that were in this clinic, they are mainly Christians from the United States who came uh, to support and uh, to, give, uh, to give help to, to those uh, Muslims. It's important to point out because it's the, it's, the, it's the little devil Israel with the big devil United States come together to help those people. Uh, and uh, uh, also in terms of uh, uh, material that was uh, sent into Syria, we talk about generators, we talk about tents, clothes, food, flour, fuel, uh, 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 a lot of stuff, uh, medication of course, uh, baby food, diapers, everything that was needed uh, uh, in those lands that uh, were a, a no man land uh, during two years. Excellent. Let's have a now look at this uh, excellent uh, video produced by Rebel Media that looks at uh, Israel's incredible humanitarian efforts to help uh, Syrians caught up in the bloody civil war. Nearly 250,000 Syrians have been killed in the past four years. While the war was largely ignored by the world till the recent refugee crisis, one country has been saving the lives of thousands of wounded Syrians. Dr. Tarif Bader is the Deputy Surgeon General of Israel's Defense Forces. He recently led the Israeli Defense Forces humanitarian mission to Nepal. I think it's, uh, it's the same uh, humanitarian mission that we are doing all over the world uh, with uh, one difference. Uh, the major difference is that we are talking about a, a, a extending a helping hand uh, over a hostile border. <laughs> We saw the people suffering there. Uh, at the beginning, it was very far away from Israel that we cannot go and reach the, uh, the, the towns in Syria. But when we saw that they are just uh, near the border and they can reach us to, to, to get help, we decided to, to, be, to be there as it was supposed from us. The state of Israel uh, until now has had treated more than 1,500 Syrians in Israel. Uh, part of them were treated in the, uh, in the military field hospital uh, in the Golan Heights and part of them were treated here in the, in the hospitals in, uh, in the northern part of Israel. Uh, all of them are Syrians. It, for us, it doesn't matter if they are fighters or not, they are Syrians. All of them were treated here and all of them who could be, who could be uh, discharged back were discharged back to, uh, to Syria. In my opinion, it's, uh, it's a humanitarian mission. So they are people, they are suffering people, they are our neighbors, even though the, they are, the relationship between Israel and Syria are not a, a state of, of peace. But again, we saw people who are suffering and, uh, and we, are, we are helping the people, the people there. The state of Israel continues to save the lives of thousands of injured Syrians, while many in the Arab world turn a blind eye. For the Rebel Down Media, I'm Egal Hecht. Uh, absolutely uh, astonishing and incredible work being done uh, by Israel there in helping many of the Syrians caught up in the civil war there. Um, that was just absolutely inspirational. I mean, the fact that Israel was able to help over 250,000 Syrians caught up in the civil war who needed urgent medical treatments, uh, Vivi. What impact do you think, lasting impact, that would have on, on, on those Syrians who have seen Israel uh, for the first hand, seen the love and the generosity and the support that Israelis are able to give in compared to the hatred that they were fed through the Syrian education system and media towards Israelis? So I don't think really that this can have an impact in the whole country. The situation in the country is very, very complicated, but at least we are able to help quite thousands of people. And I'm sure that for those that got some help from the state of Israel, they will perceive Israel on a different way. And they will be more critical when they listen to the incitement against Israel inside Syria.
Excellent. Uh, and if we look at Israel today, uh, Israel is an incredible modern success story. Israel is a high-tech nation. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing we recognize about Israel is that Israel is a democracy, the only true democracy in the Middle East, uh, surrounded by uh, very hostile uh, neighbors. Um, but what would you say is the biggest strategic threats face it, facing Israel currently? Simon, without uh, any doubt, the uh, biggest uh, strategic uh, uh, threat that Israel faces today is uh, Iran. But Iran is not only a threat uh, to Israel, it is a threat to the whole Middle East, and it is a threat to the, to the Western civilization. Uh, Iran has long tentacles inside Gaza and inside Lebanon, and it's uh, actively financing terror groups as the Hamas and Hezbollah that seek to destroy the state of Israel. On the other hand, we know that uh, Iran uh, uh, was responsible for uh, uh, terror attacks inside Europe, in Netherlands, in Denmark, and in France. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, Iran uh, continued to develop its uh, ballistic missiles that uh, they can reach any place in the Middle East, but they now they want to increase the range of uh, those missiles in order to, to be able to reach uh, Europe as well. Uh, why should they do that? And um, uh, its interference in other countries in the Middle East, uh, uh, it's really a threat to the stability of the region. Uh, they are in Syria, they are in Iraq, they are in Yemen. So it is uh, something that uh, all of us uh, need to be worried about. Uh, let's go to this uh, excellent report put together by CBN that looks at the 40th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution in Iran and looking at its legacy. In 1979, the world was introduced to the menacing glare of the Ayatollah Khomeini. His Iranian revolution ousted the Shah of Iran, a U.S. ally, and put its mark on American history with a hostage crisis that lasted more than a year. Its leaders began to purge the country of Western influence and set Iran on a path of expansion and Islamist terror. During the revolution, the U.S. was dubbed the Great Satan by the ruling mullahs. Still, most of their hatred was reserved for the country they called the Little Satan, Israel. For four decades, they have vowed to wipe it off the map. The show of force continued this month as Iran paraded its missiles in Tehran. I think a clash is inevitable. Middle East expert Michael Widlansky says according to Israeli military sources, Iran has armed Hezbollah in Lebanon with enough missiles to bombard all of Israel for weeks. Lebanon itself is so well armed with Hezbollah missiles and rockets that Israel could face every day not 10 rockets, not 100 rockets, but 2,500 rocket attacks every day over a period of three weeks. And that doesn't take into account Iran's nuclear program. In last year's UN address, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu exposed a secret nuclear site with 300 tons of nuclear material. Now, I also have a message today for the tyrants of Tehran. Israel knows what you're doing, and Israel knows where you're doing it. Israel will never let a regime that calls for our destruction to develop nuclear weapons. Not now. Not in 10 years, not ever. While Widlansky warns Israel can take care of itself, he worries if the mullahs aren't stopped, their grand design could swallow up the region. The Iranians want Shia Islam to be the face of Islam. That means they want to go after Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait. They want to go after all their neighbors and project their force all the way to the Mediterranean and to the Atlantic. They want to go through Lebanon and then through North Africa. They want to go through Yemen. They have a real, real expansionist process, which is similar to what the communists and the Nazis had. This is not just a religious calling. This is very serious power politics strategy playing. John Wagi, CBN News, Jerusalem.
Excellent report there put together by uh, CBN. Uh, Vivi, when we look at the situation, I mean, it's not only the regime over the last 40 years has, has actually called for the destruction of the State of Israel. We had the uh, previous Iranian president, Ahmadinejad, who wanted to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and uh, denied the Holocaust. We see the Supreme Leader, the um, Homini, also uh, talk about how the ultimate goal of the Iranian regime is to destroy the state of Israel, and this comes from the very leadership uh, within the, uh, is the, the, uh, the within the regime itself. But also, we, we've seen how that uh, President Trump has put um, Iran's support for uh, terrorism um, and also Iran's development of nuclear weapons right up there on the international political agenda. Um, how important is it, for example, that uh, that the world, particularly Europe, wakes up to the threat posed? by a, a nuclear run. So I think that the Trump administration really played a very meaningful role in uh, creating uh, awareness uh, around the world regarding the threat uh, that uh, Iran uh, poses to us. Uh, it, is, it is indeed uh, very important that we start uh, uh, relating to Iran as a real and concrete uh, uh, threat. And uh, I think that there is a difference uh, in the way Europe has been dealing with Iran and the way the Americans and Israel uh, have been dealing uh, uh, with Iran. The Europeans believed that uh, signing an agreement with Iran would be the best uh, solution in order to solve uh, the problem. It's not that they don't think that there is not, that there is not, uh, they don't believe that Iran is not a problem. They just thought that is the best solution is to sign an agreement with Iran. But uh, we believe that this agreement is not good enough because it doesn't, it doesn't cover all the threats that uh, Iran uh, poses to us. First of all, it's limited in time. Yes, it was signed for 10 years. We still have uh, another five or six years to go. And after the end of this agreement, Iran will be able to continue to develop uh, its uh, nuclear weapon. And the agreement doesn't deal with two other issues that are very, very important. The development of uh, uh, ballistic missiles, as I said before, sure. uh, that uh, they continue to develop uh, those ballistic missiles. Uh, they are directed uh, to Israel from uh, Syria. And uh, on the other hand, they want to increase the range in order to reach also Europe. Uh, and the other thing is the interference in the countries uh, in the area, as I mentioned before, Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, Yemen, so, so, but uh, Trump was very uh, meaningful in creating this kind of awareness around the world. So let's have a look at a press conference um, that was hosted by the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, in which the Israelis showed the extent of Iran's nuclear weapons program. Iran lied. Big time. After signing the nuclear deal in uh, 2015, Iran intensified its efforts to hide its secret nuclear file. In 2017, Iran moved its nuclear weapons files to a highly secret location in Tehran. A few weeks ago, in a great intelligence achievement, Israel obtained half a ton of the material inside these vaults. And here's what we got. 55,000 pages, another 55,000 files on 183 CDs. Everything you're about to see is an exact copy of the original Iranian material. First, Iran lied about never having a nuclear weapons program. 100,000 secret files prove that they are. Second, even after the deal, Iran continued to preserve and expand its nuclear weapons know-how for future use. Why would a terrorist regime hide and meticulously catalog its secret nuclear files if not to use them at a later date? Third, Iran lied again in 2015 when it didn't come clean to the IAEA as required by the nuclear deal. And finally, the Iran deal, the nuclear deal, is based on lies. It's based on Iranian lies and Iranian deception. 100,000 files right here 
prove that they lied. Uh, one thing we have to note that uh, it is Israel that is actually not only protecting the Middle East, but also protecting the free world, thanks to the incredible work carried out by uh, Israeli intelligence. Um, absolutely a remarkable discovery there, uh, a Vivi, of the extent of Iran's nuclear weapons program and how Iran lied to the international community. Uh, and isn't it another time in history again where if it wasn't for Israel, um, the world would be in a much more dangerous and darker place. Um, and I know you can't talk much about this one, but can you share the, the contribution made by uh, Israel there in actually protecting not only the Arab states, but Israel, Europe and the free world from a nuclear run? Yes, I think that, uh, as I said before, uh, uh, Iran, is, with his uh, uh, tentacles, uh, is trying to destroy Israel. So uh, you see the, the absurd situation in which uh, Israel is right now. We have, we have Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon uh, trying to actively destroy uh, Israel. Hezbollah is uh, an organization that was founded in order to remove the Israeli troops from Lebanon. Okay? The Israeli troops were removed from Lebanon. They left Lebanon uh, by decision of our Prime Minister Ehud Barak in uh, the year 2000. So what is the raison d'etre uh, of uh, this organization right now? We left Lebanon uh, 20 years ago. So they want to destroy Israel. This is very, very clear. On the other hand, in uh, Syria, we have uh, uh, Iran has been using Syria as a, as a base for its uh, missiles, missiles that are directed to Israel. So we are fighting uh, uh, those uh, uh, terror organizations. We have an intelligence that is able to uh, discover things uh, like that. And uh, yes, our army is always prepared and our intelligence is always prepared to counter uh, the Iran radicalism. Absolutely. Uh, and talking about the threat posed by Iran, uh, the fact is that the Iranians have under their control something like 80,000 uh, troops and militias under their control in Syria and are only 50 miles from Israel's border on the Golan Heights and that uh, Hezbollah themselves have something like 160,000 rockets and missiles aimed at Israel. Um, and if we start to see um, the, Iran, the Iranian forces approach upon Israel's border, can we expect Israel to respond? because we've also discovered, thanks to Israeli um, uh, intelligence and technology, that uh, Hezbollah have been building terror tunnels under Israeli territory to carry out military operations inside Israel. Um, how significant is this? Uh, and you know, possibly could we see Israel going to war against Iran in the near future? I hope we not be able, uh, we not need to go uh, uh, in war. Uh, against Iran. Uh, I believe that it's not uh, of interest for any of uh, the two countries. Uh, uh, but Israel is prepared for every uh, threat that uh, Iran uh, poses to us. Uh, and uh, if you need uh, to react, you heard uh, my Prime Minister, we will react according to the needs. Excellent. So let's have a look at uh, another video produced by the Israeli Foreign Ministry um, that looks at how much uh, the Iranian regime is funding terrorism against Israel, but also discovery of these awful terror tunnels going deep in Israeli territory.
and uh, this is a, a chilling reminder uh, to us all to be uh, vigilant in the threat of Iran and their proxies, uh, Hezbollah. Uh, Vivi, when, when we saw those awful tunnels and, um, you know, if it wasn't for Israel's military operation against Hamas in um, uh, Israel's military operation against Hamas in Gaza in the summer of 2014, we would never have known of Hamas's plan of having those terror tunnels to attack uh, neighboring villages um, and kibbutzim next to Gaza and take uh, many Israeli hostages um, captive. And we see the same uh, tactics deployed by Hezbollah to actually infiltrate Israeli territory, to take Israeli hostages and to cause mayhem and carnage in, in the Galilee. Um, so what can the international community do um, to ensure that Hezbollah doesn't get away with these activities on what is Israeli sovereignty? So, yes, the IDF uh, had discovered six tunnels uh, in the border between uh, Lebanon and Israel. And the aim of uh, those tunnels uh, is to attack Israeli villages in the north of Israel. It was to send terrorists inside Israel in order to kill as many civilians as possible and kidnap uh, another few if possible. Uh, but I think that all these uh, discoveries that the IDF uh, had made create a lot of awareness in the uh, international community because uh, everyone now understands that uh, Hezbollah is not a peaceful political party in Lebanon. Hezbollah is a terror organization that seeks to destroy the state of Israel. And uh, in this frame, I think that we need uh, to praise uh, the British government for uh, uh, proscribing Hezbollah in its entirety, uh, and not only the military wing. Uh, and I hope that many other countries in the world will follow the British example and uh, will ban uh, Hezbollah. Absolutely. Uh, and, and can you also share with us the state of the peace process with the, uh, with the Palestinian Authority uh, and the fact that um, we, we're seeing that President Trump has really changed the agenda by freezing um, money and finances to the Palestinian Authority. Even the European Union now are looking to freeze their aid money to the Palestinian Authority. Um, in light of the incitement in their education system and uh, their media against Israel and the Jewish people? Uh, yes, so I don't think that we need to blame the Americans or a uh, Trump administration for the impasse in the peace process. Uh, the problem uh, is much, uh, uh, it goes uh, from a long time already. It's not, uh, it's not something that happened in the last uh, few years. Uh, as we always say, the Palestinians never uh, miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. So when we signed the agreements in Oslo about uh, 25 years ago, while later, a while later, you could see already uh, terror attacks in our cities in Jerusalem, uh, suicide uh, uh, bombers in uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, uh, while we were negotiating uh, uh, the agreement. Uh, later on, Prime Minister Ehud Barak met Yasser Arafat in Camp David, and uh, uh, PM Barak was ready to make huge concessions uh, to Yasser Arafat, but in the end, Yasser Arafat refused. A few years ago, Abu Mazen was the one who declined a very generous uh, offer by Minister, uh, by PM uh, Ehud Olmert. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, he wasn't brave enough. I think that he couldn't cope with his own people. I think that he maybe cannot give up uh, uh, the dream of seeing uh, a Palestinian state replacing Israel. Uh, so. This is uh, together in parallel of uh, the incitement in the schools, as you had mentioned, the incitement in the, in, the, in the media, and the fact that they continue to pay salaries to families of terrorists that uh, are in prison in Israel or committed the uh, suicide uh, attacks uh, in Israel. So you see that we don't have a partner. Uh, and, and the impasse is because of, uh, of that. They, they, they don't accept any of our offers and they, they cannot uh, come with a counter offer. So uh, Trump administration is not the one or the Europeans. Uh, we don't need to blame anyone. The problem is, uh, uh, is uh, with our partners in the negotiation. Yeah. Uh, and how are the uh, leadership of the Palestinian Authority finding themselves um, at odds with what's happening strategically in the Middle East? Um, the, because of the rise of ISIS and 
because of the uh, Iranian dominance of the Middle East. We, we find that Israel is developing uh, new strategic ties with the, the Gulf states, um, with Saudi Arabia. Um, Israel's relationship with Egypt and Jordan has become stronger. And it seems very much like uh, the Palestinian Authority is at odds with what's happening in the region. Do you think that any pressure can be placed upon the Palestinian Authority by the moderate uh, Arab Sunni states um, to not only recognize Israel as a Jewish state, but also to make constructive peace efforts um, on behalf of the region? So, uh, uh, yes, we need to start pointing out that uh, we have uh, diplomat full diplomatic relations with uh, Egypt and uh, Jordan uh, for many years now. But the uh, homogeneous uh, policy of the Arab countries in the region was always that they would not normalize their relations with Israel till they don't see uh, a solution for the Palestinian problem. But it looks like they uh, got uh, tired of waiting. You know, they've been waiting for 25 years, and they see that uh, during this period, Israel was ready to make uh, concessions. Israel actually made concessions, gave back land, uh, but they don't see any active step from the Palestinian side. On the other hand, we have common, we have mutual interests in the region, and we have common threats as well in the region that we need to deal with. So they understand now that uh, the only way to, do, to, to, to deal uh, uh, with uh, those streets and uh, to enjoy uh, 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 those interests, to, it's a combined forces that collaborate uh, with Israel. Uh, and they will not be waiting for the Palestinians uh, to, 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 to solve the problem. You know, we have uh, threats. We have uh, Iran is a threat. The very radical Shia regime is a threat. And we have the terror organizations, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, that we need to deal together. We need to combine efforts in order to fight against them. And uh, in terms of uh, mutual interest, uh, the, the Arab world wants to... to uh, uh, diversify their economy. They don't want to be uh, uh, very dependent of, on the oil that they produce. And Israel is the best partner to help them in diversifying their economy. We have uh, high tech, we have uh, expertise in agriculture, and we can be very helpful. So they will not, uh, it looks like they will not uh, uh, be waiting for the Palestinians to, to solve the problem. Which is, uh, which is good for Israel, and it's great to see those strategic uh, developments taking place in the region. Uh, Vim, I have to ask you about something that is obviously close to, to our viewers' hearts as well, um, and that is the opportunity that Brexit presents. We know that, uh, for example, only recently um, Israel and Britain signed a new trade deal. What opportunities does Brexit offer um, Israel in terms of strengthening British-Israeli relations? I always like uh, to talk about uh, Israeli-British relations. I, I, I love uh, to have uh, this opportunity because I think that uh, we have very strong relations between the country and I hope that they will uh, uh, continue to, to, to strengthen uh, from year uh, to year. But uh, uh, we are very proud of being the second uh, country in the world to sign an agreement with uh, the UK uh, uh, post-Brexit. And uh, it's very interesting actually because one can understand from the newspapers that the Brexit has caused some kind of instability in the British economy, and one would expect to see uh, uh, problems in the trade between uh, the UK and other countries around. But uh, the trade between uh, Israel and the UK shows exactly the opposite. Uh, over the years, the trade, uh, the bilateral uh, uh, trade, became a. Uh, 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 bigger and bigger from from 2016 where we uh, the trade was about 5 billion pounds we finished the last year 2018 with a trade uh, over 8 billion pounds uh, and yes i hope that uh, our relations uh, we continue to to thrive uh, for the sake of uh, business from both sides and uh, for the sake of uh, the economy in our uh, two countries absolutely which is which is also very good um i have to talk to you about uh, uh, sadly something that is uh, uh, affecting not only britain but also europe and the entire western world and that is the alarming um growth of jew hatred that we're seeing around the world today um the extent in France alone, I think it's eight has risen by, uh, in 2018 by 84 percent. Attacks on Jewish uh, cemeteries, attack on um, memorials in Paris to uh, a French Jewish citizen who was murdered in 2006, um, and the extent that we're seeing this problem grow. What, what is Israel doing in order to try and help her uh, 
uh, Jewish communities uh, around the world and also empower Christians to make a stand against the evil that is anti-Semitism. So, yes, it is uh, indeed a very sad and uh, worrying situation. And the problem is a, it's a global problem. It's not, only, it's not only in the UK, it's not only here in Europe uh, or in France. Uh, it's a global problem. We, we see uh, anti-Semitism coming from uh, the far right. We see anti-Semitism coming from the far uh, left. And there's an anti-Semitism that is coming from the radical Islam. Uh, Israel uh, monitors uh, very much the situation around the world. We keep uh, very strong relations with the Jewish communities around the world. And when we have meetings between uh, governments, uh, this is one of the issues that uh, are always raised, the situation of, uh, uh, of uh, the anti-Semitism. But uh, the only thing that I think, or the main thing that we need to do is always uh, continue to condemn any kind of uh, racism, discrimination, uh, hatred, and uh, of course, uh, anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, we know that uh, when something starts as anti-Semitism, we know from our experience that something starts at, uh, as anti-Semitism, it never ends only with the Jews. So it's an issue that uh, concerns uh, all of us, and we need to continue, each and every one of us, of course, the governments, we need to continue to condemn this kind uh, of behavior. Absolutely. And um, we're down to the last six minutes of the programme, Vivi. So I have to talk about something which is uh, really quite remarkable, and that's the growth of uh, tourism uh, to Israel. And uh, I think Britain ranks fifth on that list. How important is it that our wonderful Christian viewers who, who love Israel and the Jewish people um, actually go and visit Israel for themselves and to see the incredible sights and everything that Israel has to offer? So I think that it is uh, indeed uh, very, very important because it's a kind of support that the Christians uh, give to Israel and they go and uh, visit. But it's not only that. Simon, when you go to the old city and you walk on the path uh, of uh, Jesus in the old city of Jerusalem, you see the Bible coming alive. So it's a total different uh, experience for those Christians and uh, for everyone actually that comes uh, uh, and see those things. And uh, uh, the image that you have of Israel, I think that totally changes when, uh, when uh, you are there uh, uh, seeing the country. And actually there is something for everyone in Israel. If you like uh, beaches and the nightlife, you go to Tel Aviv. If you like, if you are, uh, uh, want to, to, to see uh, nature, you can go to the south, you can see our deserts, or you can see our Greenlands in the north, and maybe some snow in, uh, in uh, Hermon Mountain uh, during the winter. And uh, if, you, if you like archaeology, there are so many spots all over the country. And if, you're, uh, if your issue is religion, so yes, the old city of Jerusalem and many, many other areas in the north of Israel. So, and I think that uh, today we see this increase in the number of tourists because today Israel uh, has an infrastructure that uh, uh, allows uh, millions of uh, tourists to come to Israel. They have very good hotels. The weather is the main thing, uh, I would say. is the best thing about uh, Israel, a very mild weather, uh, especially when it's very cold here in Europe. And I think that uh, uh, people uh, uh, talk about it uh, more and more, and they see that uh, it's really easy to go to Israel, and uh, it's very, very interesting. So it is important to continue to go to Israel. I think that it changes the perceptions about Israel and it enhances the lies between uh, the Christian community and Israel. And uh, I would like to really uh, encourage every one of our viewers to go and visit Israel. Absolutely, I second that as well. So let's have a look at this uh, wonderful report about the rise of tourism uh, in Israel.
So you also got an opportunity to go on the uh, Revelation TV tour of Israel uh, in June, and that's something not to be missed. Uh, Vivi, we're in the last uh, few moments of, of, of the program, so I really want to say what role can Christians play in standing with Israel and the Jewish people? The fact that, that you're on this program and that you're reaching out to uh, Bible-believing Christians who have a love and a passion for Israel and the Jewish people just shows the strength of relationship between the Christian community and the state of Israel. How can that continue, and what role can Christians play in standing with the one and two uh, democracy in the Middle East, which is Israel? So I think that uh, the Christians can play a very significant role in standing uh, uh, with Israel. And uh, yes, as I said to you, I visit uh, many, many churches in the, in the UK. And I always say that uh, this is, uh, I, I always hear from the Christians that they are praying for Israel. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I think that it is uh, very, very important. But I always say that it's a three-step way. You need to pray for Israel, you need to educate about Israel, and you need to advocate for Israel. So it's not only, all of them are important, okay? So uh, 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 I, once again, would like to encourage uh, those uh, Christians that support Israel to start advocating for Israel. As I said, there are many ways to do that. There are many advocacy groups here. And uh, uh, this is my message, my, my message uh, to you today. Stand for Israel, advocate for Israel, educate about Israel, and continue to pray for Israel. Uh, Vivi, I, I just want to thank you because uh, you are a wonderful uh, spokeswoman uh, on behalf of the Israeli government and uh, you're a real asset to the Israeli embassy in London. So thank you for your knowledge, your, your passion uh, and your insight and I'm sure it's had a big impact on our viewers watching today's programme. So on behalf of, uh, uh, of the Middle East support on this programme, we, we love Israel, we love the Jewish people and our, our viewers are passionate about standing with Israel. So uh, thank you so much for being my guest on, on today's Middle East report. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. You are very, very kind. And uh, I hope uh, to see you again in another opportunity. And uh, shalom. Shalom. Thank you. And I just want to thank you for watching today's Middle East report with uh, Israel's uh, Director of Public Diplomacy at the Israeli Embassy in London. And uh, it's so important that we stand for the truth uh, regarding Israel. And that means not only praying for Israel, but also getting involved, um, attending rallies, attending meetings where we have uh, Israeli spokesmen. Uh, let's not allow the lies and the misinformation about Israel taint people's views. So let's all be advocates. For, for Israel and remember that Israel is a beacon of light in a very, very dark region of the Middle East. So thank you for watching today's Middle East Report.